Thank you for watching part one of our video series on disaster preparedness. Today we're going to talk about actually getting prepared and some steps that you need to take to ensure that you and your family have the optimal chance for not only surviving but thriving in an emergency situation. It's said that there are only nine meals between mankind and anarchy and what that means is that with you and your family going without food for three days things will get hairy and things will get chaotic. And you have to put yourself in the shoes of other folks that are also possibly without food, possibly without water. Keep in mind that an average person can survive approximately three days without water and approximately three weeks without food, give or take. What can you do to increase your chances of survival during a disaster? First step is to develop a disaster preparedness plan. Reassess your risks periodically. Identify your local resources that may be available, and those are going to be local, state, and federal, as well as neighborhood resources. Talk with your neighbors and friends about starting a cooperative of some type. I can tell you it's going to be a lot easier to survive if you've got two, three, four, five neighbors or friends in close proximity that can also help prepare with you and also be a resource for you if things should go south. Stock and store essential items and barterable items. We'll get a little bit more into detail on that as the video progresses. Find fallback and evacuation locations. What I like to say is that you want to have an immediate fallback location, meaning something dramatic happens and within two or three hours you need to have somewhere to relocate to. And then even from that location, maybe another two to three weeks later, you need to have a final fallback location. And in addition to that, you need to make sure that you have some paper maps printed of how to get there with some instructions on paper. And you can buy waterproof maps, which is what I recommend, and, and give those out to your family. Maybe keep those in your everyday carry bags in your vehicles. Have a safety security plan in place for your home and travel. That means that if you needed to bug in and stay in your house for an extended period of time and there was civil unrest, looting, rioting, uh, those types of things that you have a way to defend yourself and your family and the same thing when you go on the road should you need to jump in your car truck and hit the road to get to your fallback locations that you have a way to protect yourself and your family during those travels have bug out bags ready plus bug in bags plus other bags and and bug out bags are basically hey i need to hit the road and there's a couple different types of bug out bags one would be a three-day survival and then one's a little bit of a longer term survival pack which could be seven to ten days bug in bags or hey I'm staying home everything's at, at, at the house you just need to know where it's all sitting and then other bags would be pet needs medical needs first aid those types of things train and assign tasks to family members um, everybody should have a part to play in a survival situation I know uh, sometimes family members may think this is all fun and games, may think it's a joke, may even resist doing some preparation with you, and that's okay, but they still need to know what part they need to play and where the materials are and the resources are should something uh, happen. It's, it's obviously better to get them trained up in some form or fashion, but if they resist, at least let them know what's going on. Stock additional meds and medical supplies. Some of the first people that are going to suffer the most are going to be the ones that have medical needs. For instance, if you have a CPAP machine or you have a specific medication for diabetes or some type of other medical ailment that you take daily and you don't have a one month supply, which is a lot of times a hard, hard, hard thing to get from doctors prescriptions, um, you're going to be the first or they're going to be the first to suffer. And so it's extremely important in my opinion to spend some time, getting some additional meds, even if it's only two to three weeks, it's, it's better than not. And then again, if you have a decent uh, resource uh, and cooperative built up between family and friends, maybe you can share meds should that, uh, should that need arise. Have cash reserves or its equivalent outside of the banking system. I'm sure everybody knows that their money, the money that you have in the bank is technically not yours. You sign a document saying that you're turning it over to the bank and the bank uh, basically has a promise to repay you um, in some form or fashion. And in America, we have FDIC insurance. So there's a, you know, your funds are basically insured for $250,000, I believe is the latest number. And so there are, there is some, um, there's some safeguards in place. I still wouldn't trust it completely. I would uh, definitely have cash outside of the banking system. And I would also look at some type of a um, alternative 
barterable asset. It could be silver, it could be gold, it could be in the form of, of coins, um, could be coffee, cigarettes, I don't know. You, you choose it, some type of barterable asset, uh, but definitely have that outside of the banking system because uh, should the electricity go down, day one, credit card machines, um, ATMs, everything are going to be useless. And then you want to follow local and national news. And one of the things that's interesting is it's pretty small on this on this page. But U.S. adults under 30 are now more likely to uh, uh, listen and respond to the news from social media more so than actual news. So I think that's a big shift in our in our society. And then, you know, as we go through the video, I'm going to have items on every page to talk briefly about in water. Um, obviously, is the most important thing you can stock in a disaster emergency uh, because that's going to be a, a three days is what is typically known for people to survive without water and so even if you don't have water you want to make sure that you have a filter system two or three stage filter system available but you're much better off having at least 30 to 60 days of water in the house most people recommend 90 days um, if you can get up to a year, again, that's going to take up a lot of storage. It's impossible for most folks, but that's where the water filter comes in. And keep in mind that as a general rule of thumb, it's one gallon of water per person per day in a survival situation. That includes sanitation, cleaning, and, uh, and drinking. Let's talk briefly about the different types of preparations you need based on where you're at, based on where you're living. There, there are three different main areas that you're going to be living in in the United States. Urban areas, which are going to be population dense, lots of infrastructure, lots of shopping. Um, much harder to evacuate from just because of the limited amount of roads, the number of cars on the street. And you, you got to assume that on a normal day, if a car breaks down like on I-10 or I-35 uh, coming from you know, the Louisiana, New Orleans area, or even I-35 heading north south from say san antonio to dallas if one car breaks down on that road it usually creates um a jam pretty pretty big traffic jam on the highway imagine if five or ten run out of gas at all at the same time because again we're not going to be thinking clearly and most of us are not going to have full tanks of gas the moment a disaster happens and so you're going to get on the road praying that you can find gas to keep the trip going and, and in a lot of cases that's not going to happen Communication is typically a lot easier to do, at least at first, in an urban area. And then um, you're going to see a lot more uh, potential hazards, and that's just due to a lot more people, a lot more chemicals, um, just a denser population. Suburban areas, that's, that's basically where I live. Uh, density is not as much. Transportation is spread out a little bit more. Um, you're still going to see a lot of traffic congestion and limited roadways. Um, you will have, uh, in my opinion, better resources because uh, you're not dealing with the population density and those resources are going to be able to get stretched a little bit further. And then even in suburban areas, you have the ability to be self-reliant to some degree, meaning you can plant um, you know, some type of garden in your backyard that will grow some food, probably not enough for you and your family, but cer certainly enough to supplement um, whatever your diet may be, if if a disaster goes on for long enough. And then communication, it's extremely important in suburban areas to get to know your neighbors, start those co-ops, start a, a you know, disaster prep group. And uh, I can't tell you how much easier things are going to be if you've got some resources with some additional folks involved. And then rural. A lot of folks think that the rural areas are going to be the easiest suit to survive in. And I would agree with that with a few exceptions. Um, one of the benefits of the rural area is that you're not dealing with such a large population density. And so whatever resources you have or have available can go a lot further. Most of the times in rural areas, there's hunting and fishing. So you have some additional uh, calories you can get from, from those food, those food items. Uh, you have typically less roads, less medical, uh, less of the things that would be in a suburban or urban group. So for instance, if you had some type of medical issue in a rural area, it's going to be a lot harder for you to get treatment than if you were in a suburban area. And so that's one of the downsides of rural 
uh, rural area disaster prep. And, and again, most important area would be to stock medical supplies and medicines. You're typically going to be a little bit more self-sufficient. Typically, folks in the rural areas uh, have learned to get along with a lot less than the folks in the suburban and urban areas. Uh, again, we talked, you know, there's going to be some opportunities for agriculture, meaning you're going to be able to farm. You're going to definitely be able to hunt some. You're going to be able to fish, depending on what part of the country you're in. And one of the other challenges you have is communication, right? So if communication goes down, your cell phone's not working. Um, I hope you have a ham radio, shortwave radio, or at least some decently powerful two-way radios to communicate with your neighbors. Uh, that's going to be a challenge in the rural areas. Types of disasters you could face. Um, natural disasters include earthquakes, volcanoes, hurricanes, floods, extreme heat, uh, wildfires, tornadoes, droughts, food shortages, uh, winter storms, energy shortages, solar storms, and, and more. Man-made disasters, the ones that we've seen, uh, chemical spills on trains recently, um, nuclear accidents like uh, you know Chernobyl's the most recent one, uh, Fukushima in Japan. Terrorist attacks, those are happening just about all the time in different ways in different countries. Cybersecurity breaches daily. I know there's a big fear of uh, getting a cybersecurity breach that could take down our grid or grids. And electromagnetic magnetic pulses, th those are a big concern because they're not necessarily going to uh, harm anybody physically the day that they happen, but long term will destroy infrastructure. Riots, looting, and lawlessness, this seems to be a daily practice in some states and some cities uh, with folks uh, doing basically, you know, team looting, team thefts, mass transportation accidents. There's been uh, numerous mass transportation accidents recently. I know I'm in Greece right now and there was a, just an incredibly awful uh, head-on collision with some trains recently here, 2023. Epidemic, pandemic, uh, we've all been through enough, heard enough about that with the with the recent uh, pandemics we've all experienced. Building collapses and structural failures, typically that's due to some type of earthquake. And again, I think just recently there was uh, reporting this September, 2023 and uh, in Morocco, uh, I think a couple thousand folks have died just due to earthquakes, uh, specifically in regard to building buildings collapse. Those are the basic disasters that we're gonna see or we're familiar with. Now let's talk about how to prep for those. And don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel. One of the reasons I'm doing these videos is because I actually am educating myself at the same time uh, that we're running through these videos. And I thought, well, as long as I'm doing all the research, putting all the material together for myself, I might as well put out some content that maybe some other folks can benefit from. I truly hope you do. Um, I have a pair of pink socks on this. And one of the, the reasons that the socks are there. Uh, is because during a you know grid down disaster preparedness disaster prep whatever you want to call it situation um, you need to to keep sanitation at the forefront of your thoughts and you know being prior military one of the things that was always hammered into our our brains is to keep your feet dry so that you don't get any any fungal infections um, and I, I can't tell how important it is just to change your socks and stay as clean as you can as things are happening. Steps in the disaster planning process. Uh, we're going to assess risks and probabilities. So if you look at the, the previous couple of slides that we talked about, about the different types of disasters, you're going to go through that list and you're going to say, okay, you know, I'm in northern Texas or I, I'm in an area that's prone to tornadoes and extreme weather events. And so I'm going to prepare accordingly for that. And, and that's what you're going to do. You're basically, you know, if you're in New Orleans or Houston, you're going to, or, or Florida, you're going to be preparing for hurricanes and, and uh, you know, being a, a New Orleans native, um, we always had some amount of water and some amount of food in the house. But during every hurricane or during every potentially bad storm, uh, the family was always still running out to the local stores and buying additional stuff. And you'll see that um, every storm in New Orleans, that's what happens. People just run out and, and grab what they can and the water runs out quickly and, uh, and, and, and food shortly thereafter. It never gets completely empty, but it does, uh, it, it, the, the shelves do get bare. Create a family emergency plan. We're going to get into detail on that in a second. Build emergency kits. Those are your bug in, bug out bags and you know, medical pet kits. Secure your home. Uh, you know, self-defense, uh, have some wood to, to board up windows, have some decent locks on your house. 
maybe have some solar lights that surround your house. So even if the power's out, they'll recharge during the day with the sun and you can um, get some use out of those at night. And so uh, develop evacuation plans. That's going to be a you know one or two stage fallback plan. Make sure again, I'm, real, I'm a real big fan of waterproof maps because the minute you get out in the field and you start walking or you drive somewhere and your maps get torn or wet, uh, they're useless. So invest in some waterproof maps, physical maps, not phone maps. Assume that you're not going to have signal. Assume that GPS is not going to be working. Stay informed. Monitor your local news, state, uh, national. And again, this is kind of where the co-ops come into place. Or again, if you've got you know a ham radio, shortwave radio, you can you can communicate a lot easier as long as you've got some way to to generate power for that to keep it working, which is is doesn't require a lot of power, depending on the uh, how far you're trying to transmit. And then stay updated. You always want to reassess the risks in your area. If you know, obviously, the weather risks typically don't change other than seasonally. So if you've got you know, let's say. A chemical plant opened up down the road well that's going to be another risk that you need to assess for and plan for um, assessing risk so you're going to look for local risks you're going to look for anything historically that's happened in your area you're going to assign some probabilities typically in, in numerical form hey this has a 50 percent chance of happening this has a 10 percent chance of happening um, check with your local authorities uh, your local geography, if you're not in a seismic zone or a flood zone or in an area that's, that traditionally has landslides, then you're probably not going to be preparing for those much. Check your climate and weather patterns, public alert system, make sure that you have one or, or, or if you don't, um, you know, again, co-op with your neighbors, uh, stay in touch and then look for evacuation routes. I know, again, having lived through this a, a bunch of my life, if if a hurricane is coming to the New Orleans area, uh, typically people are going to be evacuating, typically in some direction on I-10, at least for a period of time until they get to another major intersection to go north. And um, so I-10 always gets congested. Or for instance, if you lived on the uh, the West Bank of New Orleans, or if you lived in um, say Chalmette or St. Bernard Parish, I'm being specific there, but I could say the same for Austin. If you're living in somewhere that's only got one or two ways out of the area, uh, assume that those are going to be congested and that you're going to have to sit in traffic a longer time, which means that I hope you have gas, um, which brings up a whole other situation of people getting into the gas lines and having to wait an hour to get you know, some, some limited amount of gas, better than nothing. When you look at the top 10 states at risk for natural disasters, Texas is number one, and that's typically due to the uh, to the hurricanes, Louisiana being second, obviously hurricanes, Florida being third, again, hurricanes. And then you get into California, Colorado, and that's what you're seeing is basically the damage per household. And then you get into the states with the most natural disasters. It's Washington, California, Florida, and Texas. Again, pretty much the same, uh, the same list. And so being from Louisiana and living in Texas, um, you know, whether, wherever I go, I need to be prepared to some degree. Creating a family emergency plan this is essential to ensure the safety and well-being of your loved ones during the various unforeseen situations, natural disasters, man-made, other emergencies. Uh, just quick steps here. Sit your family down, go over the plan, identify potential risks. Um, I say the, the most probable risk for everybody is going to be something to do with power outage, something to do with the water. Um, even in a major disaster, those are going to be the first things that go out and in a natural disaster, hurricanes, tornadoes, uh, extreme weather events, you know, snow, water, water, water and power typically are the first things that go out. So almost across the board, you need to be prepared for some, um, mid to extended period of time with no power and no water. Establish communication plans, and that's going to be emergency contact lists, out-of-town contact, and then practice your communications. One of the things that's important, and you see this on movies sometimes, is that if, say, the parents are at work, out of town, whatever it is, and you've got some you know, teenager, uh, teenagers at the house alone, if something happens, the parents cannot communicate with the teenagers or the family at the house. And so the family at the house sits there and says, okay, what do we do? What do we do? If you have an emergency plan in place where if if you're not around, if the parents aren't around and the kids are at home 
hey, you know, these are the first three things you do. Number one is you go by your neighbor's house and you talk with your neighbor. If your neighbor is not there, that's aware of the plan. Then you go to your other neighbor's house or you walk to your cousin's house around the corner and you stay there. And then if you have to bug out from there, then you're going to go to this location. And so you'd need two, three, four fallback points that everybody knows about. And so that way, if you come home and the kids aren't there, you know that you're going to go to, you know, place A first, place B second, and then and then place C. It's important to at least have a few. You can't plan for every, plan for every contingency, but you at least need to have uh, something in place so that you have the possibility to reunite with your family immediately. And then create your emergency kits. We're actually going to get into a little bit of detail on these kits, but again, bug in, bug out, you know, hazmat chemical. If you want to spend the money on some um, uh, hazmat gear, there's a few websites that I'll recommend to you that that, uh, that, that have gear that's that's affordable. Pet kits, um, car emergency kits, uh, and most people don't have these, but I can tell you if you if your car breaks down, which almost every person in the world will have their car break down at some point or another, you definitely need to have a little bit of water, a little bit of food, flashlights. Uh, blankets, those types of things, and I'm not saying big blankets, but you need to have something uh, prepared so that if you're stuck on the side of the road for you know six, eight, twelve, twenty-four hours, whatever it may be, that you can survive in that situation. Uh, evacuation plans, we've talked about those. I like uh, waterproof maps, um, you know, meeting places, uh, child and, and pet care needs. Again, you know, medicines. Uh, clothes. Uh, one of the things that's often overlooked uh, if you need to bug out is comfortable shoes. And so for instance, right now, if you went home and you're at home and you had to bug out, and you had to go for a walk, a 12 or 24 or 30 mile walk to get somewhere because the cars aren't working and whatever, you're out of gas, you probably don't have the right shoes for it. And um, you need to buy the right shoes. And, and there could be a couple types of shoes, meaning if you're in a you know, rocky, hilly place and you're going to be going in and out of fields, you may want to get some comfortable boots. Or if you're just going to be on the road, then maybe you're going to get some comfortable walking or running shoes. But whatever it is, you need to think about that, both for you and your children. Emergency contacts. Again, I think that's a paper list that you have at the house. And if you wanted to laminate it, so much the better so it can't get destroyed. Uh, staying informed about local, state, and national news. Uh, update your plans. Uh, practice and review it. So for instance, you know, you can go home tonight and, you know, turn off all the lights in the house and say, okay, you know, okay, Bobby, where's the flashlight at? Okay, Janice, where do we go to get the candles? You know, those are the types of things that if you wake up in the middle of the night, the power's out, you don't want to be fumbling around your house in the dark looking for stuff. You want to have that stuff readily available. Everybody needs to know where it's at. Um, we, we've talked about updating and maintaining your plan and then just stay involved with the community, start some co-op teams, get to know your neighbors. You, you don't have to get crazy with this stuff, but I think a little bit of prudence and a little bit of preparation will go a long way should a, uh, you know, some type of disaster happen, both, you know, minor and major. Emergency kit. So this is basically a bug in bag and a bug in bag is basically something you're going to keep at your house and you're going to have you know, in, in a bug and bag, part of your bug and bag could be, okay, I've got a pantry of food. That's part of the bag. The other part could be, hey, here are emergency meds uh, in this one area. Um, another part of the bag could be, these are our light sources and fire sources. Um, waters, one gallon per person per day. There's a couple of cool things you can do with that. You can get a water bob that goes in your, in your bathtub. Um, you can make sure that you've got the filters in place should your water run out. Uh, obviously, if you're in a um, humid or wet in, in climate, you if it rains a lot, put some buckets outside, collect some water. Just keep in mind that you need to boil the water if you're going to be consuming it, um, or you need to have a, a decent water filter. And I don't recommend um, a, a one-stage water filter unless you know that the water is, is decently clean to start with. You can get some of the the multi-stage water systems that filter a lot more, um, and I, you know, you can get a Berkey or something like that, uh, some type of nice filter for the house. Uh, and then food, obviously, you want food. The, what the rule of thumb is: twelve hundred minimum for women, fifteen hundred for men. But two thousand calories is better to plan with. And so basically, you would go to your pantry and you'd say, okay, I've got a can of soup that's, you know, twelve hundred calories. Um, I'm going to extend it by adding some water to it. I'm going to make sure that the water is clean and this is going to go for a meal. And then I'm going to do that a couple more times today between three people, pastas, rice, beans, stuff that's easily storable. Manual can openers assume that your power is not going to be working. So you're going to need a way to open cans. You can get P38s. You can get any number of manual can openers off of uh, Amazon or the internet. 
cooking supplies. I like to stock a lot of propane for my propane um, grill, uh, but you can get uh, butane propane. You can have wood if that's available. Just keep in mind that the more that you're broadcasting, you're cooking and eating food, the more of your unprepared neighbors are going to show up to, to eat some of your stuff. And obviously, if it's a short-term situation shared, if it's a longer-term situation, um, you know, be prepared to have to say no uh, should that arise. First aid kits, we talked about that, meds, uh, bandages, those types of things, sanitation supplies, toiletries, toilet paper, trash bags, personal hygiene. One of the things that you need to think about immediately is what are you going to do with your trash? Where are your kids and family going to be using the bathroom? How do you dispose of that? Um, those things are going to come up very quickly. How do you wash your hands? Uh, how do you take showers? And so, you know, uh, female hygiene products, uh, toothpaste, hand sanitizer, soap, all of those are going to be incredibly important because you've got to assume you're not going to be able to get those uh, for very long in a situation that that's, that that goes on. Flashlights, uh, always keep extra batteries, flashlights around the house. Make sure people know where they are. You can also get hand crank radios and hand crank flashlights. I've got a couple of those. They don't put out a lot of light, to be honest with you, but it's better than nothing. And the hand crank radios... Um, if you crank up a radio, it may last a couple minutes before you have to re-crank it. Hey, again, better than nothing. Um, certainly, I would have those on stock or on uh, in, in a kits and a couple of the kits are in stock. And uh, blankets and sleeping, sleeping bags, um, even if you're not using, you know, if you're in a warm climate like Texas or any part of the southern, southern uh, continental U.S., um, you're saying, I'm never going to sleep in a sleeping bag. Well, you don't have to sleep in it. You can sleep on it uh, just as cushion, or you can use it to cover windows or block lights or cover stuff. A lot of sleeping bags are waterproof, so you can, you know, if you have materials stored outside, um, you can put them over something that you want to keep out of the rain. Uh, but but there's multiple uses. In addition to sleeping bags, you want to get some tarps. Uh, those types of things are invaluable. Make sure you have extra clothing, prescription medication. I hit on that a lot because that's literally just going to be the first the, the first thing that you notice you don't have. Important documents. You know, if you wanted to have a folder with some important documents that you could grab and go, and again, you can get waterproof folders. You can get fireproof folders. Um, you can even get um, uh, folders that block EMPs, uh, Faraday cages, Faraday pouches, those types of things. And then barterable items, silver, gold, cash. Um, I can tell you in a long-term, you know, grid down or disaster preparedness, disaster prep situation, uh, cash is going to be almost worthless. And so people are going to be much more inclined to trade for food, water, or something uh, that has value long-term. Tools you're going to need, multi-tools, wrenches, pliers, duct tape, can't emphasize getting duct tape, can't emphasize getting paracord enough. Uh, you're definitely going to use those. You're definitely going to need those. Make sure you have some scissors to your knives to cut stuff with. Matches or lighters, um, I'm a big fan of, of both. I don't see why some people go to the extreme immediately of just going all waterproof matches. You know, like, hey, buddy, this lighter is good, you know, for a very long time. Use the lighter to start a fire. You don't have to go, you don't have to go prehistoric immediately. Um, you know, use what you can. We got to assume that whatever happens, it's not going to be happening for long because if something was happening for months or years, then, you know, obviously this video is going to help a little bit, but, but not a ton. Books and games, you're going to need a way to entertain yourself. If you've, you know, if you've ever been in the military or you've been deployed somewhere, um, you know how boring things get so quickly. You know, the, the first couple of days are exciting, you're in a new place, but then after that, you're like, Jesus, what do I do with all the, this time that I've got on my hands? And um, so, books, games, something to do during the downtime. Uh, pet needs, obviously, talked about those and then much more. And then I have a picture of a, of a generator here because I think um, you, generators are relatively expensive especially the ones that are quiet and i'm not a fan of the the gas generators as much as i am the tri-fuel generators because you can burn typically you know gas propane or 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 some other you know whatever the, the third source is um i am a fan of the quiet generators and that's where you can get into these hondas or some of the other ones that are quiet and again the reason you would want something quiet is you don't want to av advertise two or three streets away that you've got power at your house you're going to have neighbors and people coming over there that you don't know and some of them may be hostile so i'm a fan of generators i think the whole house generators are great i think the whole house um, natural gas generators are great um, i think the quiet generators are great especially because they're semi-portable you're not going to walk far with it but you can take it with you Emergency kits, 
Part two, bug out bags, um, water and water purification tablets, um, or the water purification uh, plastic totes you can get. You can get like uh, straws or anything like that. They're, they're great. I definitely have them. I definitely have them in my everyday carry bag or in the cars. Non-perishable food. Again, you're going for calorie content and protein. Um, stuff that doesn't uh, go bad and will get in get into it in a different video, but the the length of time something is good for in storage typically depends on the temperature more so than anything. And we'll talk about that in a later video. Cooking and eating supplies, again, if it's uh, short term, um, yeah, just throw a couple old forks, spoons, and knives in there. If it's long term, then you're going to be able to, to scavenge stuff that you need. Shelter and warmth, again, three days, you need sleeping bags, you need a tarp, you need something to keep you warm and dry, maybe a change of clothes. Again, recommend socks and underwear, keep changing those. You don't want to develop any type of skin irritations in a bug out situation. First aid kits, navigation, again, assume your GPS isn't working unless you've got a satellite GPS device, which, which buy one if you can afford them, they're expensive, but they're great. Communications, two-way radios, typically the two-way radios that you're gonna, you're gonna be able to buy, you know, over the counter are not gonna not gonna go very far. They typically need line of sight or something close to that. The more powerful ones are expensive. Most people are not gonna be able to afford them. But being able to talk with your friends and family using a two-way radio that runs on, you know, double A batteries is gonna be invaluable, especially if you're scavenging or scrounging in a specific area and you want to be able to stay in touch for security purposes. Headlamps, um, lights, flashlights. I like headlamps because it frees up your, your hands. I also like headlamps that come with the different lights. So I like headlamps that have the red light, um, in, infrared, um, white, because at night, if you don't want to advertise your location, maybe you're walking through the woods with a red light on versus the white. Fire starting tools, matches, lighters, um, magnesium fire starters, sticks, multi-tools or knives, you're definitely going to need that. Personal documents, personal items, uh, you know, sanitation items, extra supplies, again, paracord, duct tape, uh, you, you'll use that day one. Self-defense and protection, it, you know, that's a whole other topic. I don't, I don't want to tell you what to do, what to carry, what to buy. Me personally, I'm going to have a firearm, I'm going to have a knife, I'm going to have a firearm with some additional um, magazines, ammunition. The rule of thumb, though, in a self-defense situation or grid down situation is that if you have one, you have none. If you have two, you have one. Because you've got to assume that uh, whatever you have is going to break and then you're going to be without it. So you really want to have two uh, two of anything with you that, that is a, an essential. And so keep that in mind. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. Self-defense and protection and then entertainment, books, those types of things we talked about already in a bug out bag. Med kits, again, everything you can imagine you think you would need. Here's a quick list, not exhaustive um, for medical kits and pet kits, uh, medicines, um, you know, trauma, trauma, injury, uh, treating material, tape, um, eye wash or saline solution, burn gel, um, emergency blankets, just everything you have at your house right now, plus or minus, should be a good start with some additional items thrown in there off this list or you can google some other lists securing your home so let's say it's a bug-in situation you're at your house and you've got to stay at your house for a period of time obviously you want to make sure you know where all your kits are you, you follow your de your developed emergency plan um, your home has been secured as much as possible and that's going to differ depending on if you're in the you know you're in a 20-story high-rise versus a single family home standalone versus in you know rural rural America on 20 acres. But you want to make sure that you secure your property and even to the extent that if you're in a long term bug in situation that you have some type of watch system set up. So if you've got four or five family members, I would definitely think about putting in a night watch and even a day watch so that uh, you can stay abreast of what's going on around your property. Educate yourself. There's tons of books you can buy. Actually, on the third part of this series, we're going to, we're going to give you a bunch of resources that you can look at. A lot of them are free. Some of them you have to pay for as far as uh, that goes. The, the stuff that's that's free and digital, I would take it and download it or print it because you want paper copies. And the books that you're going to probably want to buy, again, don't, 
don't hesitate to spend the money on them because what most people don't consider is that when you're spending money on prep stuff, especially books or materials or something like that, it's a one-time purchase. You're not buying this stuff every year. So if you had a budget of a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars for this, or if you wanted to say, hey, a hundred dollars a month is what I'm going to spend on my prep, you know, my preps for disasters, then you can that money's going to go really far because you're not going to be respending it on the same stuff every month. So buy it, keep it, hand it down to kids, gift it, whatever you need to do. But a lot of it's one-time purchases. Um, you know, I, I think it's important for your kids and family to know how to turn off the gas, turn off the water, turn on the water, the gas, the electricity. Um, if, uh, if time permits, teach them first aid and CPR skills. Uh, make sure they know local evacuation routes and shelters. Make sure your insurance policy at your home has some type of coverage for damage to your property. And again, it's a whole different conversation, but you, you can get um, coverage for disasters. You need to speak with your local agent about that. Uh, consider backup powers, generators, uh, solar. I keep in mind that solar just does not put out a lot of power. So you're probably not going to be able to run your refrigerator, washer, dryer, those types of things, but they will typically give you enough power to charge front, uh, phones or uh, run lights in the house. Food and water storage, we've talked about that. Uh, home security, um, solar activated lights, I like, the, I like that. Um, I like uh, you know, night watches, day watches. Um, evacuation plans, if you needed to leave your house and you needed to run out the back door and it's kind of a free for all at that moment, where do your kids and family know that they need to run to? If you needed to run out of the back gate, where's the first place? Because what you don't want to do obviously is, you know something dramatic, crazy happens and everybody's got to just flow out of that back fence, you know, at hundred miles an hour. And then, you know, four out of your five family members take off in different directions. So they need to know where to go first, at, at, at least if possible. And then from there, um, you can, you know, zig and zag is needed. Network with your family, friends, neighbors, conduct emergency drills. And that would be something just as easy as what we talked about earlier, which is, hey, turn off the lights in the house. You know, OK, Bobby, you know, where, where are the flashlights at? You know, get, get them to, to kind of physical rope memory, get to these things that you're going to need. And then stay informed. Um, stay on the radios. Again, you know, shortwave ham radios are going to be the best if, if it's a grid down or some type of situation for a long time. Develop evacuation plans. We've talked about this. Uh, evacuation routes, meeting points, communication plans, who are the emergency contacts for the family, special considerations if you've got a, a pet, medical supplies, or somebody with a disability that can't get far. Um, and for those types of things, I actually like to buy the Wagons Academy actually sells this. Um, I think people consider it a beach wagon. You take it to the beach or it's a kid's wagon, but it's a little bit um, more of an upgraded wagon. It's It's got the... Uh, the soft uh, cloth walls versus like the red wagon type things. I like those. I use those on construction sites and they work well. You can throw a bunch of stuff in there. They go over a lot of terrain. They don't have the rubber wheels, so they do get stuck sometimes. And if you can get a wagon with a nice rubber wheel that can actually, you know, resemble a, obviously not as big as a car tire, but something that can go over bumps and rocks a little bit easier, uh, that's going to be the best. Practice your evacuation drills. Know your local resources. Stay informed. Uh, evacuation plans for your vehicles. Uh, you're not. You're never going to go to sleep and wake up with a full tank of gas, right? When things happen, they just happen. But for instance, if something happens and it's the first day and everybody's still calm and peaceful and the world is just kind of cruising along, for instance, if the electricity and the water go out and if for some reason you can fill up your car uh, with gas, then go do it. Uh, it. Same thing as if you can get to a store in the first couple of days of a disaster and everybody's still acting normal and there's you know nothing crazy going on. You know, buy what you can with with, uh, with the resources you have, because that's going to change relatively quickly. Uh, neighbors and communities, yeah, you know, I emphasize that all the time. Network, you, you will not be a lone survivor. You're not going to go, uh, you know, Rambo on this thing and survive with your family. That's not how this is going to play out. You're going to need uh, friends, family, and neighbors to survive. Emergency contacts, we talked about that. Uh, bikes, foot, squads, whatever you can put your hands on. And then obviously re reevaluate and update this plan. Uh, periodically. Stay informed. News neighbors, government plus, modify your plan as needed. Talked about that. Um, this is the end of part two. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to uh, smash the like button and subscribe to our channel. I'm going to be putting out these videos every so often. 
uh, as I as I uh, get all the material together. Um, if you have any suggestions or any comments, please leave them below. The next part of the video is going to be a little bit more extreme. Uh, we're going to talk about other considerations, extreme situations and resources, and that's going to be where we really get into EMPs, um, you know, coronal mass ejections, uh, nuclear events, uh, chemicals, uh, biological events, things that uh, are not going to be uh, probable, um, but possible. So uh, part three will be out soon and I uh, look forward to seeing you there again. Uh, smash the like button, subscribe to the channel and leave any comments below. Thank you.